Um, so um, delighted to welcome Robert Cahan here from UC Berkeley. So Robert teaches a graduate professor at UC Berkeley in the Civil Engineering Department. Uh, and recently retired as senior scientist in US Geological Survey, um, has taught at Berkeley for many years uh, in the program and, and did your PhD at Berkeley as well. That's right. Um, so teaches across the, the program, um, previously held appointments in UCLA and in Japan. Um, Robert's research spans many different areas that we were discussing this morning, from sensors, LIDAR, satellite monitoring, Earth observation. Um, but the focus of his talk for us today is going to be publicistic modeling of shear wave velocity of big fires soil. So, Robert, the floor is yours. Well, thank you for having me. I appreciate being here. And um, my interest is in the zone between Earth science and civil engineering. So I'm interested in geomatics, geophysics, and the ability to non-destructively, and some, sometimes destructively, make measurements of the subsurface. And in, in this particular talk, it's in relationship to understanding something about earthquake damage. And uh, so there are not a lot of major, large magnitude earthquakes that happen in the British Isles. So I'll talk a little bit about in detail about soil liquefaction and how it manifests itself in the field and how uh, very different from the kind of modeling that you would do in a laboratory or in a centrifuge testing. And we're very interested in that as well, how we model this problem in the field for practitioners to use to characterize the probability of liquefaction occurring at a site. This Okay, I don't know if this is going to work or not. Oh, it is. Good. Okay, um, the outline of the talk today, uh, I'm going to tell you a bit about what seismic soil liquefaction is uh, in terms of triggering and also in terms of uh, its measurements in the field. Uh, we're not going to talk about deformations associated with liquefaction. So we're really looking at the onset triggering and in that way that it's defined, uh, indicating the onset of damage. There's some reasons why we want to use field measurements. The traditional field measurements that were used for this are standard penetration test and cone penetration test. Today, I'm going to talk mostly about shear wave velocity. There's some historic limitations of why the that model was sort of the last to be developed of the three that are used in standard practice today. We use some new advances in the methodology to develop shear wave velocity profiles non-destructively in the field using surface waves to have a field campaign where we would try to make measurements at sites that had already been characterized using standard penetration and cone penetration testing. Then we'll talk about the actual modeling elements of how we come about developing a probabilistic model and how we cast it for liquefaction using Bayesian updating and system reliability tools. There are some benefits and deficiencies of using shear wave velocity. I'll talk about them. And I'll talk about the probabilistic framework that we use to characterize liquefaction versus the deterministic. Okay, um, before I go there, I do want to say that there's a good close relationship between Cambridge and Berkeley. And, uh, you know, we have the benefit of Kenichi Soga being with us. And, and one of the things that he immediately did was pull in those of us who have sort of similar mindsets and develop what you already have here, which is a center for smart infrastructure. So that's exactly what we've done most recently at Berkeley, pretty much modeled after what you have already done here. So we're following your lead in the Center for Smart Infrastructure. Um, Kenichi, uh, Dimitrios Zekos and I teach a course on infrastructure sensing and modeling. I'm sure you have a very similar course here for that purpose. Kenichi is of course very focused on optical fiber, brilliance, Raman scattering and so on. Um, I have my interest, Demetrius has his interest, 
we have a integrated course where we look at geophysics, spatial modeling, point cloud analysis, and so on. And uh, so that's taught to a mixture of undergraduate and graduate students. We also started the Center for Smart Infrastructure, again, modeled after Cambridge. And uh, you have your natural, national research facility uh, for infrastructure sensing. So we're trying to model our capabilities after what's already been developed at Cambridge. So you've taken the lead and we're following behind you. And it's very much in align with what's happening here. Our focus has been of late, primarily water delivery systems and in terms of infrastructure, buried water systems and wastewater systems. So um, that's our, our focus. Our large scale testing facility is a large pipe testing facility where we can simulate pipes buried in the ground in a large shear box. And we can do four point bend tests on pipes to test, for example, seismic resilience of joints, whether pipes pull apart or not based on new, new design to joint fitting. So that's the large lab facilities. Our equipment and our capabilities uh, are spread out across various aspects of uh, infrastructure sensing. So obviously fiber optics on the left, on the right, excuse me, in seismic geophysics, electrogeometrics, uh, geotechnical electromagnetics, LIDAR, uh, terrestrial laser scanning and airborne laser scanning. Kenichi worked a lot on wireless sensor networks. And so that's uh, an active part of our research. Uh, virtual, virtual reality modeling, subsurface investigations by destructive methods like home penetration testing and, and other testing methods. Uh, I'm very interested in, in some of these other aspects of geomatics, UAVs and different sensors. So when we look at our group that's involved in the CE 170 course, it breaks out largely uh, in different interest areas. We teach different modules of that course. So my interest is in, so again, the earth science aspects of civil engineering. So I'm interested in engineering geomatics, differential GPS measurements, uh, the ability to get a point cloud either from light bar or structure from motion. The ability to model deformations from INSAR and persistent scatterers in the landscape using satellite uh, radar beaming and microwave beaming to the ground. And seismic geophysics. And the talk today is going to focus on that last topic. So I'm going to focus on how we make velocity measurements in the ground and relate them to liquefaction uh, occurrence in the past. So definitions of soil liquefaction. So this is a very uh, Harry Bolton seed, Berkeley-esque kind of definition of soil liquefaction. There are others, but this is the one that we use to define liquefaction for relatively level ground. And it's the condition under which there's a transient state of elevated pool water pressure that rises up to a level equal to the effective overburden stress and the ratio of which approaches 1.0. And that's our definition for soil liquefaction. Globally, we find that soil liquefaction happens in relatively shallow deposits, the upper 20 meters of the soil column. Young deposits, deposits that have not been consolidated or otherwise improved. In the man-made environment, marine container facilities, coastal construction that hasn't been improved, a lot of legacy structures, legacy levees and dams are associated with poorly compacted bills that end up being susceptible to liquefaction. In native deposits, we see Fluvial deposits, coastal dune deposits, barrier island deposits being highly susceptible to soil liquefaction. Um, in around the Bay Area, we see, oh, we see, for example, the highest areas of potential for soil liquefaction happening in the most coastward, youngest near surface deposits. Okay, these are the consequences of soil liquefaction. Everyone knows this 
very famous image in the upper left is from the Kawagishiko apartment buildings. We're going to revisit that site in a, in a few slides where we're going to do testing at that site and many other sites. And that's an example of one of the problems of liquefaction where the buildings lose their bearing capacity. And so long after the earthquake has ended, it could be several minutes after when cool water pressures migrate and coalesce beneath the foundation of a structure, the structure loses its bearing capacity. And in this case, quite strong structures, literally just rolling over on soft ground. That's where structures that are negatively buoyant for structures that are positively buoyant, for example, storm sewers, stormwater drains, objects emerge out of the ground, liquefied soil. So the soil is no longer has shear resistance and the buoyant structure just comes emerging out of the ground. In this case, nearly two meters uh, stormwater drain coming out of the ground. Uh, settlements occur when soil liquefies. The particles collapse on themselves and the pore water pressure rises. And then as the pore water pressure dissipates, there is a denser state of the soil. And so we see overall bulk settlements occurring on the surface. And it's manifested itself very strongly at places where we had a hard resistant object against settling soil. So here, for example, on the approach to a bridge where the soil met the concrete structure of the bridge, it was fine on the day prior to the earthquake. After the earthquake, uh, the person who turned towards this bridge encounters a one or two foot wall, basically. This is a, a common source of fatalities after earthquakes that people drive, they approach structures, and they find that the soil has settled in front of the structure and they have a large impact uh, accident. Lateral spreading is a, a, a problem with liquefaction where we have a layer under the ground and the ground is uh, has low shear resistance, but the surface layer above the liquefied layer is uh, perhaps not saturated and has a crust. And that crust is rafted on the liquefiable layer. So the liquefiable layer in this particular case is down at about three meters. And what you see is the disturbed crust above it being displaced by the liquefaction on a moderate slope. One of the problems with soil liquefaction is large strains in the ground. And so we see pipelines being pulled apart in ground that's liquefied. So as a result, we have gas leaks and gas breaks, and we also have the loss of firefighting work to put out fires. So conflagration is a major source of disaster after earthquakes, and it's usually associated with liquefaction of the ground. And so this is the case in San Francisco in 1906, where the firefighting water drained entirely into San Francisco Bay from the elevated reservoirs because of pipe breaks, and then some very small fire ignitions around the financial district of San Francisco coalesced into a great fire. This most recently happened in the Noto earthquake, 2024, and we're just gonna, we're studying that right now, but in Kobe in uh, 1995, a good example of pipeline breaks leading to a large conflagration of about one and a half kilometers by uh, close to a kilometer in width, a district burning to the ground because of pipeline breaks associated with soil liquefaction. Okay, those are the consequences of liquefaction. Let's, in the field, when we make measurements to try to predict whether liquefaction will occur, uh, to, in a very typical engineering manner, we approach the problem in a seismic demand soil capacity manner. And so the typical way that we analyze these problems is on the left, we have seismic demand plotted against soil capacity, whatever the measure of that soil capacity is. In the old days of deterministic analysis, there would be one line drawn, but now we cast these problems probabilistically. So we have around perhaps some deterministic boundary. We have now probabilistic curves, and that's what's being expressed over here on, on the left side. For the standard penetration test, I'm giving, I'm giving you three examples 
of, of a collaboration that has gone on now for, for two decades. This is from Andre Chetton. He's at Middle Eastern Technical University. And here, the seismic demand is expressed as the cyclic stress ratio. And I will talk more about that. And here, it's plotted against the standard penetration test resistance. So how many blows it takes to advance a sampler uh, 12 inches into the ground, the, the, the last two six-inch intervals in an 18-inch uh, hammering uh, with a standard weight drop. The second method is the cone penetration test. So here we have cyclic stress ratio, and you see that CSR star, that means it's magnitude uh, and effective stress corrected. And we'll talk about that in a moment. And that's plotted against cone penetration resistance. So that's from Rob Moss. Rob Moss is at Cal Poly San Luis Obispo. And this is a correlation that was developed in 2006. And then the one that I'm going to talk mostly about today is the shear wave velocity correlation. And here, again, we have some measure of soil capacity, which is an effective stress normalized shear wave velocity plotted against cyclic stress ratio. So all three of the field correlations sort of are, they're faithful to this idea of demand capacity relationships and determining whether or not we fall into the higher probability or lower probability of liquefaction occurring. Uh, the, the reason why I'm very fortunate to have been able to do the shear wave velocity correlation is because after I finished in the 1990s, I finished my PhD at Berkeley, I had worked on energy methods for soil liquefaction occurrence. And um, so I had gone to many sites uh, in the US, but I also had done a large literature search. And in the large literature search, I basically, in those days, pre-PDF, pre-internet days, uh, you know, we made telephone books of, of all the sites, where they were, what their properties were, and so on, and then who reported on them from what earthquake. So um, after I finished, I got pulled in to be part of the dissertation advising team for these two young students, Ander Chetton and Rob Moss. Ander was taking care of the SPT problem. Rob Moss was taking care of the CPT problem. Ray Seed was there. He's retired now. That's what RET means. So Ray Seed is the son of Harry Bolton Seed, and he was interested in sort of passing this problem probabilistically. And the wizard behind the curtain was actually Ernest Craigian, who works on first order, second order reliability models and Bayesian analysis, and is very much of a mathematician, disguising himself as a civil engineer. So a lot of the methods that we used were Armin's. Anyway, so I worked with these two students, and they were cataloging hundreds and hundreds of sites that I couldn't analyze with the energy method because I didn't have the data set, but they had the standard penetration test and cone penetration test data set. And they were sort of making me realize that there was a real problem with the shear wave velocity correlation as it had been cast at that time. So I was interested in shear wave velocity as a ways to characterize so initial soil liquefaction. I wanna first talk to you a little bit about why we would use shear wave velocity and add it to the standard penetration test and cone penetration test correlation. Unlike the SPT and the CPT, shear wave velocity actually means something geotechnically, right? It's a real fundamental property of the soil. And we can relate the seismic strains that are accumulated in the soil uh, to the shear wave velocity and the density and the shear modulus. So G max is the shear modulus, and we can relate all of these terms together, and we can model that in the laboratory, we can model that in the field. <clears throat> we know from studies by Dobry that the initial pool water pressure rise that occurs during liquefaction happens at relatively modest strains. So one of the reasons why we might want to use shear wave velocity to characterize the initial triggering of liquefaction is that there is a good correlation between the peak strength 
of the soil and phase transformation of the soil against shear wave velocity. But at critical stage in high strains, it's a very poor correlation. Okay, so we might not want to use shear wave velocity to characterize the ultimate deformations that occur at a site, but it might be very useful to characterize that initial rise in cool water pressure and the loss of stiffness of the ground. In field studies, we do very much the same kind of analysis as is done in the laboratory. Here we compute a cyclically induced stress. So I can't use my pointer here, so maybe I should move my, the mouse over here. So here's the cyclically induced stress uh, that's taken as uh, the peak acceleration of the earthquake that's reduced by a factor of something like two thirds. And we're going to have some correction factors and then an effective stress correction as well. So the cyclic stress ratio is taken as a measure of the overall stress induced on a soil element in the ground normalized by the effective stress. And the shear wave velocity, well, we can take the shear wave velocity and some velocities are gonna be down at deep depth, some are gonna be near the surface, and we can normalize them to a common reference stress by an effective stress normalization. And we do that uh, using the equation below. So we have terms here for demand and capacity that are both effective stress normalized. R sub D is a correction factor for the fact that the acceleration at the surface is typically higher than the acceleration at some level in the soil column at depth. So we have an amplification that occurs at the surface. And even though the stress is increasing, the acceleration associated with that stress is decreasing. And so it ends up causing a reduction that's associated with the mass participation of the soil. These are, this is an example from Andre Chetton's work from 2004, where we would reduce the peak acceleration as a function of the magnitude, the stiffness of the ground, and so on. The relationship to reduce R sub D uh, is, again, it gets scaled as a function of magnitude, peak acceleration, and stiffness of the ground, and the, the way that it's been cast in R depth reduction correlation is to average the shear wave velocity in the upper 12 meters of the soil column. So we use that as our characteristic to adjust the stiffness of the ground. The benefits of using shear wave velocity to char characterize this liquefaction problem, it's a fundamental property of the soil, unlike the SBT and the CBT. We have strong theoretical basis for using it. We can measure it in all materials. You can penetrate a lot of materials that are gravelly, that are stiff, that are bonded and cemented. You cannot penetrate them easily in the field, but with shear wave velocity testing, we can make measurements on all of these materials. The limitations of doing a shear wave velocity measurement is we have no collection of a sample. You can't easily go out and have a practitioner or a contractor make a shear wave velocity measurement and necessarily rely on it unless you do your own due diligence to make sure that the measurements are being made properly and you're characterizing the shear wave velocity properly. And then finally, we're making a very small strain measurement on a process that's not high strain, but moderate strain. So there's a, a mismatch between the field measurement and what's actually happening at an RU of 1.0, an initial liquefaction in the field. These are some early correlations that um, were done. Peter Robertson is a cone penetration test expert uh, from the University of Alberta, and now he's in California as a consultant. And uh, Peter's quite a remarkable person. He had only five points. It didn't matter at that point. Five points was enough for him because there was no pre prior curve. And he cast a curve for something like a magnitude 7.5 corrected curve for liquefaction. He really did the first work. As a graduate student, that's, I first met Peter. And uh, 
We have been making a lot of measurements after the Loma Prieta earthquake and earthquake in San Francisco that happened in 1989. And so the correlation curves in the middle plot were while I was still a student, we were publishing our best estimate of what that boundary looked like. So that's over 30 years ago, those early correlations. And then the first real good effort to try to make a large catalog of sites was by Andrus and Stokey in 2001 and uh, 2000, excuse me. And Andrus and Stokey populated a much larger data set. But when I looked at what was happening in the data set with Andre Chetton and Rob Moss, there was this disconnect. And, oh, I'll come back. I'll tell you what the disconnect is before I move on. The, the disconnect was that most of the sites from Anderson and Sophie were from the United States. So they were from earthquakes that happened in California, in Bora Peak, Idaho. And that was largely it. And there were a few sites that were international, but otherwise it was very much a domestic data set. But when I saw what was happening with Onder and with Rob Moss was, oh, three quarters of their data set was in China, Japan, Taiwan, some sites in Europe, right? Sites that were much higher in cyclic stress ratio, a much broader range in soil properties. So this correlation was missing, basically was capping out on with almost no data above, like a cyclic stress ratio of 0 0.4. So we were going to go to Japan, to China, to other sites where we had much higher accelerations and try to fill in, in particular, this high cyclic stress ratio, high shear wave velocity zone with earthquakes that happened there. Those of you who here as students and you look around the room and you sort of think, oh, will I know these people in 10 years? Well, you will, and you probably will be working together. And one of the great fortunate things that happened for me back 35 years ago after Loma Prieta earthquake is that Koji Tokimatsu, who was an expert, still is an expert in surface wave testing and a good friend of the Berkeley program. He had already done a postdoc there and spent two years and worked with Harry C. He came back to make measurements. Well, we were making measurements too. I just showed you the shear wave velocity correlation uh, that we had done in the field. And that was with downhole testing and seismic cone penetration testing. Well, Koji Tokimatsu came with just a suitcase. He didn't come with a big drill truck or a cone penetration truck. And he put out instruments on the ground and he measured the surface wave dispersion and inverted a shear wave velocity. And wow, we walked away from the site. It would take an hour or two. We'd collect this data non-invasively, measuring surface waves at the surface and it used the wave theory to invert the appropriate shear wave velocity associated with this, this surface wave dispersion. Well, it, as a graduate student, it blew my mind, right? It was, a, it was amazing what he was doing. And I, I had the good task. My advisor, Jim Mitchell, told me, your job is to make sure he goes to every site and he makes his measurements and he has no problems. And I spent two weeks just filling notebooks about what I was learning from this man. Anyway, we've worked together for 35 years and most recently in Hokkaido after some earthquakes in Northern Japan. And so we've had this working relationship now. That's what I'm telling you as students, weird things will happen in your career and you'll end up having like lifelong research partners to work with and Koji Tokimatsu is one of mine. And I learned from him how to get shear wave velocities from the ground in a method that's very lightweight. It's very inexpensive, it's non-destructive. You show up at site, you make your measurement. When you're packing up, someone comes up and asks you, what are you doing here? It's just say packing up. We've collected our data. Okay. So this is the campaign that came about with this experience with these two graduate students and with Koji Tokimatsu. When they had finished their telephone books of these hundreds of catalog sites, they had done everything. They had characterized the magnitude, 
the cyclic stress ratio, the depth reduction factor, the effective stress, the total stress, everything. The only thing that, and of course, the standard penetration test measurement or the cone penetration test measurement. The only thing that was missing, from my perspective, was a shear wave velocity. So I looked through their sites. I found out, unlike Anderson Stokey, most of these sites are not in the US. Most of these sites are in Japan at the time. If we can just go back to all these sites that we now know where they are, we know what the references and all the literature associated with these sites, and we made new measurements at the same location after determ determining that nothing had happened at a site since the earthquake, there'd no, be no ground improvement. We finally cast a shear wave velocity relationship for soil liquefaction. And that's, that's exactly what we did. So basically, I took a sabbatical from the US Geological Survey. I went to Kobe University to teach. And I just started making hundreds and hundreds of measurements at liquefaction sites, mostly starting out in Japan. But then it spread out to Tangshan, China, Tianjin, Taiwan from the Chichi earthquake, earthquakes in the Mediterranean, most recently Christchurch, and Edgecombe events that happened in Darfield earthquake uh, and, and so on in the Christchurch area. And this is what a campaign would look like. You're familiar with the image on the left. We already looked at that. That's the Niigata apartment buildings. It's adjacent to the Meikun High School, which has an open yard at that liquefied also during the earthquake. And we have lateral spread measurements and shear wave velocity measurements from a long time ago, we actually have great, deep, great data on this site for SPT and shear wave velocity from the past. So I reoccupied this site. At that point, it was only site number 96. So we went over a thousand years ago. But anyway, at site 96, we showed up at the site. We used our surface wave methods to characterize a forward and backward array dispersion curve of surface waves, and then we inverted the shear wave velocity profile. So this technique was repeated hundreds and hundreds of times all around the world to characterize this new data set. This is what the data capture looked like uh, way back when. This is site 90, uh, 41. This is in Hokkaido. So this is back in the year 2001, where we're capturing surface wave measurements. This box in the middle, you're going to learn about it's a seismic source that's going to generate a harmonic wave, so we get very good dispersion curves. This is uh, called the spectral analysis of surface waves method on the left. On the right side is the multi-channel analysis of surface waves methodology. And here we have maybe 16 or 24 or 36 uh, array uh, geophones that we use to measure the, the surface wave dispersion, which is the surface wave velocity relationship to frequency and wavelength. The way we make this measurement, um, we have this source in the middle, and I have it, it's here, it's a frequency controlled electromechanical shaker. And then I have two sensors in one direction and two sensors in another direction. The inboard sensors in both directions are a reference sensor, and then the outboard sensors are for making the phase relationship. We could talk probably for the better part of a session or a semester about surface wave methods. I'm gonna to try to collapse it to one slide and take you quickly through how we go from field measurement to a shear wave velocity in four steps. But take it on faith, there's a little more to it than this, but this is, the, this is what it looks like. We go into the field and we capture our data and what we're capturing are the time history of the ex of the harmonic waves generated by this source in the middle, and we're turning that with a Fourier transform into the linear spectra. From the linear spectra of the two sensors, we can take the imaginary part of one and the real part of the other, and we can calculate a cross power spectra. So what you're seeing here in this rat phase diagram 
is extracted from the cross power spectra. The cross power spectra can be analyzed to determine the phase lag of the wave that is first picked up by sensor one before it's picked up by sensor two. So there's a phase angle lag between the two sensors. And we calculate that lag as the arc tangent of the imaginary part of the cross power spectra divided by the real part. Okay, so it's very straightforward to get the phase. And the phase that's from this equation, the middle equation, is represented here as a wrap phase. We can unwrap the phase because the wrap phase just tells you that this is 180 degrees out of phase, and you have to know that that points 360, and that's 720, and that's 1080. But you can stack them all together, add them together, and you get an unwrapped phase. And it tells you, ooh, as the wavelength gets shorter between two sensors, the phase relationship grows more and more out of phase. There's an increasing phase angle delay as the wavelength gets smaller between two stationary sensors. And that's what you see here. So here we're plotting the phase angle against frequency. Frequency is going up, wavelength is going down. That gives us a dispersion curve. And that's part three here. A dispersion curve plots the surface wave velocity against either the wavelength or the frequency. The velocity equals the wavelength times the frequency. So we can break them up into two different types of dispersion curves. They're really presenting exactly the same data, but they show you different parts of different parts of the problem. When we plot a dispersion curve plotted against frequency, we see a whole zone here of high frequencies. And that's typically associated with a layer very close to the surface of the ground. Maybe just the upper meter or two is represented by 20 hertz to 100 hertz. This is all very shallow part of the soil profile. And then as the velocity increases, that might be represented of two meters to 50 meters depth, right? So we don't see a lot of the detail here. But if we express the dispersion curve as velocity against wavelength, then we see the long wavelengths, and those are associated with the deeper part of the profile. So the way you look at a dispersion curve as frequency or as wavelength, you really have to speak to, are we interested in the deeper portion or the shallower portion where we can see the details of it? That's step three. The inversion involves finding a theoretical dispersion curve that best matches the field data. So we want to find the theory that best matches the field. There's a whole suite of techniques to do inversions. When we're doing the modeling now, we are actually doing three different types of inversions, and we're comparing them and averaging them if we like them. And uh, But this is an example of just one profile where we had a least squares best fit theoretical dispersion curve, the blue line against the magenta line, which was actually our field data. One of the things that's kind of curious about all this process of uh, inversion is it's not unique. You can actually have multiple realizations of shear wave velocity that vary, hopefully don't vary much, but they still give you the least squares best fit. And so that creates uncertainty, but in Bayesian analysis and in reliability modeling, we like uncertainty. We just wanna be able to characterize it and fold it into our analysis. So we're good with the fact that the next time we run this model, it's gonna be a little different. And we might run this model a thousand times and determine the coefficient of variation around the mean. And we're going to use that in our modeling to characterize the probabilistic aspect of this relationship. Okay, anyway, um, in a nutshell, simple steps, that's the way we go about making these measurements.
That source in the middle, I want to talk about in some detail. Here there are two. I have a trailer, or I had one before I retired. I had a trailer at the US Geological Survey that had eight shakers all mounted into a frame, and the legs would come down and lift the trailer off the suspension of the wheels. And then we would shake the ground and we could shake the ground to hundreds of meters away and get very deep profiles. And what you just saw were these shakers shaking. And we use a handing window to basically provide a low pass and a high pass filter and it creates a notch. And then frequency by frequency in an automated way, we just allow most of the energy to pass through the slot. And we analyze the phase relationship for that particular frequency. And then we step down to the next frequency. So we might start at 100 hertz and go to 99 hertz, then 98 hertz, and end the test maybe down at 3 hertz and cover the whole dispersion curve. And when we use a handing window and these shakers, instead of what you're familiar with with geophysics, is to take out a hammer and hit the ground. When you hit the ground, you have to do an FFT with no filter. And you pick up everything, the truck that just drove by, people walking, wind, rain, whatever it is. Whatever noise comes into your FFT, it contaminates it. So you have a low signal to noise. When you use a seismic shaker, you can get about a 40 decibel boost in the quality of the measurement to get a much better dispersion curve. So this is the way... I went about this campaign all around the world, which I never went with a hammer. I always went with a shaker. And I tried to get this boost. Decibel boosts of 40 decibels. Decibels are, it's a log scale. 40 decibel boost is a huge improvement in terms of signal to noise quality, right? It's not a minor thing, it's a huge thing. So when we make surface wave measurements, always using a shaker, never using a hammer, never using a blast, anything like this. It's a controlled source. It's also quiet, doesn't generate vibrations, doesn't scare people. You can show up in a park, you can do it. Trucks can drive by, they're generating the wrong frequencies. They're excluded by the hand window, no problem. You wanna make measurements in the middle of the day in busy, crowded Cambridge or London? where trucks are driving by, it's fine. You don't have to wait until three in the morning to make these measurements. So that's how we went about casting that problem. By going to hundreds of sites, we characterize the shear wave velocity and knowing from the studies of Chetton and from Moss, I also knew what the cyclic stress ratio was, and I could start populating this kind of plot. And this kind of plot, shows the cyclic stress ratio plotted against effective stress normalized shear wave velocity. To analyze this problem probabilistically, what we do is we develop a limit state function. That's this function here. When the model tips negative, depends on how you set it up, but if the model tips negative where you have your capacities being positive terms, we say the probability of liquefaction is greater than 50%. And if the model tips positive, we'd say the probability is less. And we just need to determine how much less. Okay. So that's the limit state function. And so we have positive capacity terms, great. And then we have negative demand terms. And some of these terms, we don't know if they're going to be positive or negative, like effective stress or fines content, and so on. Only by doing the modeling do we calculate this out. So this is all part of the Bayesian analysis where we start with a, a prior model. And our prior model is always, we take our whole data set and there's a mathematical approach to this where you calculate the Hessian function of the, you don't need to do that. All you need to do is calculate the mean values of all the parameters that are going into your model for the positive and negative events, liquefied or didn't liquefy in the field. Start out with that as your prior and then start loading in these data. So that's how we create the prior. And these are the, relationships that we cast in 2013. So here we have the probability of liquefaction being the norm cumulative distribution function of these terms. And the terms that go into predicting liquefaction probability is the shear wave velocity, the cyclic stress ratio, 
the magnitude of the earthquake that's going to scale us. Long duration, large magnitude, short duration earthquake, low magnitude, effective stress, and finds content. We can flip this equation and we can compute, based on the shear wave velocity, the cyclic resistance that's needed to prevent the liquefaction from occurring. We call that the cyclic resistance ratio, but it's really the measurement of the soil capacity to resist liquefaction. When you see these plots and they have these points, I wanted to sort of have you sort of open your mind to probabilistic analysis, which is all we're doing in those prior plots is plotting the mean value of the velocity against the cyclic stress ratio. But really, we don't know any parameter precisely. We don't even know the magnitude of the earthquake precisely. So every single parameter that goes into the calculation of cyclic stress ratio and every single parameter that goes into the calculation of the effective stress normalized shear wave velocity, we calculate a mean, of course, but we also calculate a coefficient of variation. And that is basically our uncertainty cloud around the mean point. And so here in this plot, we see all of these uncertainty clouds around these points. And that's really how you should be looking at any probabilistic problem where you're looking at any two relationships. What's the problem with shear wave velocity? Well, here's a big one. We never collect a sample. We make our measurement in the field, we put our instruments on the surface, but we don't really know what the texture is of that layer. We relied on someone else to tell us, oh, it happened at this critical depth, and it has certain textural properties. So this is not a method you would use to analyze or explore liquefaction in an uncontrolled environment where you didn't know where you were. You would want to know the prior stratigraphy and make your measurements knowing that prior stratigraphy. We know that liquefaction can only occur in certain soil distribution ranges in terms of grain size and texture, right? And too much plastic fines create problems for liquefaction occurring. So once again, we want to know what the stratigraphy is before we employ this method to analyze probability of liquefaction. Because we had these probabilistic grounds, and again, that was part of that norm CDF that you saw before the cumulative distribution function that was used to cal calculate the cyclic resistance ratio and also used to calculate the cyclic stress ratio. We have distributions about which there's a mean. We think the cyclic stress ratio was X and we think the capacity was Y, but we have distributions about them. And we take advantage of those distributions to overlap capacity and demand and determine, oh, maybe in you know, a like Suzanne Lacoste way, a design point where the capacity and demand overlap. What is that point where these two uh, distributions overlap? Determine probability of liquefaction. So here's an example here at a cyclic stress ratio. We would calculate the mean for the earthquake. It may be for some critical structure. We'd want to analyze the plus one sigma cyclic stress ratio. And so we can plot that on the distribution and see, well, what is the probability of liquefaction occurrence at that site based on its intersection with the cyclic resistance ratio distribution. So that's how we use these uh, liquefaction probabilities to estimate probabilities of liquefaction in the future. If you were to do an analysis, for example, some location where you had some estimation of future earthquake magnitude and fault distance and fault mechanism, you could estimate with ground motion models what you thought the peak acceleration would be for the, say, 2% in 50-year event or the 1% in 50-year event, the sort of things that we do in California all the time. You don't do so much here, thankfully. You should be very happy about that, but you work on projects in other places where there is a high seismic concern. And basically what we do is we take the PGA associated with the GMM and the distribution, the sigma that's associated with that PGA, and we convert it into a cyclic stress ratio. And that gives us the curve on the left. And our field measurements give us 
the relationship on the right. And that's how we analyze probability of liquefaction. And it actually creates a kind of an interesting thing. Um, I have 10 minutes, so I'll just sort of be philosophical for a moment. Uh, you want to analyze the probability of liquefaction on a site. So what's the best curve that you would want to use? Right? What's the unbiased curve? It's the 50% probability. It's not a probability bound that has some conservatism in it, like the 20% probability of liquefaction. That's something you might tell to the owner of the site, ultimately in the end, to protect yourself. But if you really wanted to know what was likely to happen on a site, you'd use the 50% probability first. And that would correspond to a factor of safety of one. The cyclic stress ratio and the cyclic resistance ratio the ratio of that inverted is going to give you a factor of safety of one, right? And then only knowing that, do you add that conservatism? Well, what's, what's our real objective at this site? Does this site, maybe it's residential houses, no critical facilities here. They could absorb some damage. Okay, we're going to maybe operate in a mode of 20% probability of failure. What if it's a nuclear power station or a large dam or something that a hospital? Well, we don't want to have a 20% probability of failure. We want to have maybe 3% probability of failure or 2% or really try to have a nuclear power station. We won't, you can't believe what goes on in the United States. We'll analyze sites to the 1.1 million year event, like extremely high magnitude acceleration. And then the whole design gets driven by this extreme conservatism to ever, never allow failure to occur, basically. I, except for the tiniest, you can never say never. You're right, in probabilistic modeling, we never say never. Uh, we never say 100% or 0%, but we want to squeeze that failure zone to a tiny, tiny zone in the distribution. So one of the great things about doing probabilistic modeling is it allows you to ask those questions and analyze problems that way and to think, oh, wh what does our project need? And have that, maybe you've got a client, you have that conversation with the client. What level of risk are you willing to live with? You can never tell your client you have no risk, right? So you actually engage them and you tell them, you have to make a decision here. We can't drive it to zero but we want to work with you to make it as low as possible. Okay, um, those magnitude scaling factors. So we normalize all these curves to a magnitude of 7.5. And the reason is NG Ishihara, Harry Bolton C, they were experiencing the Niigata earthquake of uh, uh, 1964. And then there was the great Alaska earthquake that was like a magnitude eight earthquake up in Alaska. Uh, and they had these large data sets and they wanted to normalize around a certain magnitude and they chose 7.5 as their, as their normalization. So here we are at 7.5 and everything passes through one. And so we have cyclic stress ratio scaling functions for lesser magnitude and greater magnitude events to have the equivalent cyclic stress ratio for a small magnitude six event as compared with a magnitude eight event or a magnitude 8.5 event, oh, you might have some, you might have to have a higher PGA, like 1.3 times higher for the smaller event. And why? Because the duration of shaking is so much shorter for those small events. So when we have long trains of waves propagating through we end up having more destructive behavior to the ground. And so this is a magnitude scaling factor that is extracted from this study with the shear wave velocity. So basically we can use the, the theta that sits in front of the parameter magnitude. We can determine the change in the cyclic resistance of the soil needed to induce liquefaction as a function of magnitude and develop that scaling relationship. Um, finds content. Turns out with shear wave velocity, if we have non-plastic finds of 0 to 35 percent, it has hardly any effect on the shear wave velocity relationship for liquefaction resistance. It has all sorts of 
effects on the deformation potential, but not on the initial liquefaction or water pressure rise. Okay, so 2024, the three different methods and the three groups of us, Rob Moss, Andre Chetan, and myself, we're all working together. This is a group that's been working together now. It's getting to be like 26 years. We meet once a month at, at least once a month. We, we send postdocs and PhD students in everyone's direction so that everyone's sort of cross-fertilized in how we're analyzing these problems and analyzing the sites. And our relationship now has gone from about 310 sites from the 2013 paper. We think we're going to have a paper in 2024 that'll have 550 approximate sites. So we're trying to figure that out right now at the end. A new model formulation. I'll just put this out quickly because we're running out of time. I just want to show you that in, in 2013, we had some of the analysis happening outside of the equation. We developed a limit state function and then a probabilistic boundary. And then we analyzed these things like magnitude scaling factor and effective stress, loading effects, and so on outside of our term. Here, we're trying to incorporate them directly into the limit state function. So we're trying to be a little smarter about how we go about doing the probabilistic modeling. And this is the way we calculate it in terms of liquefied sites and non-liquefied sites and marginally liquefied sites. And one thing we notice, by the way, is we have many more sites that have liquefied than have not liquefied, like by a factor of two. Why? Because we go out in the field and we study sites that liquefy. We're not really good at going out in the site, out in the field and studying sites that didn't liquefy. So we have this imbalance. And the way we deal with these imbalances is we have weighting factors where we downweight liquefied sites and we upweight non-liquefied sites. And we also have certain earthquakes, Loma Prieta, Kobe, that's 1989, Kobe earthquake, 79 sites from 1995, Christchurch and Tohoku earthquake, most recently, 2010, 2011. And there we want to downweight the significance of those sites to upweight the others. So we're not biasing our data set with too much information from one container. And so we have various approaches and schemes to try to balance out that data set. Okay, conclusions. I was very lucky to work with these two graduate students and they made me two telephone books. Telephone book was standard penetration tests, hundreds of them and here's where they happen and here's all the parameters associated with them. And the other cat telephone book was cone penetration test sites. I went to as many of those sites around the world as I could over the last two decades to try to also capture a shear wave velocity measurement at those sites. What I found is that most of these sites are not in the United States, as was cast in earlier boundaries. Most of these sites are in Japan and China and Taiwan. A, not an, a surface weighted geophysical investigation has gone we have 460 usable liquefaction sites where we've made these measurements, and we're going to add to it a bunch of literature sites. We have about almost an uh, equal amount of sites that have nothing to do with liquefaction. They have to do with ground motion model prediction, so GMM-based sites. And then we, having all these sites, we cast the problem using Bayesian analysis and probabilistic modeling and single uh, and higher forms of reliability modeling to cast these probabilities for the book action in terms of the velocity, the cyclic stress ratio, the magnitude, the effective stress, and the fines content. In summary, these, if you want to know what's happening in a soil element, you go to a centrifuge and, and you do a test, right? Or you go to the laboratory and do a test. But if you want to analyze a site in the field for the construction or the resilience of infrastructure, we use these methods. And these are become standard methods for 
making an estimation of probability of liquefaction in the field. There's a standard penetration test. There's also a Boulanger and Idris relationship too that's competing with this. And likewise, Boulanger and Idris have a competing model with Moss et al. for the cone penetration resistance. I've spent much of this talk talking about shear wave velocity. Our group meets, we finalized all three of these data sets nearly. It's gonna happen this month because we're just so tired of doing it. Looking at these data, you end up being more of an accountant than a geotechnical engineer looking at these sites. And then we're gonna cast these new relationships and hopefully in 2024, maybe by summer, we'll have a bunch of papers in review for sort of modifications to these relationships from the last decade or so. And are things gonna change a lot? Not in terms of the general location of the boundaries, but where things will change is our definition of probabilities. Our probabilities will change for sure. And certain zones here where we now have much more data at high cyclic stress ratio, we might end up with different curvatures up in the, that high loading, high demand aspect of the problem. And that's my talk. So it's been a pleasure. Thank you very much for having me.